All right, things are looking pretty settled, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Kelsey Leos. I manage the Academic Web Technologies team in the Office of Information Technology. Uh, we're the folks who build the EEE ecosystem. We build the infrastructure that supports the Canvas environment and the custom tools for our campus. We're also the folks you reach when you pick up the phone or write an email and ask for help with Canvas. Uh, we're here today so that you can learn more about how this transition is going, what it's like to use Canvas uh, directly from people who are teaching with Canvas. So the folks who really have the most relevant experience uh, to share with you and who can answer some of your questions. We'll also give you just some brief updates on the transition process itself so you know kind of what's going on and what to expect and most importantly, how you can tell us what you need. Uh, how you can tell us what you're concerned about, what you depend upon that you need to make sure will still be there or will have an alternative to meet your needs and how you can get assistance transitioning to Canvas or just learning about it for now and, and making that uh, change at your own time and pace and in a way that works for you. Uh, so please don't hesitate to be in touch. If you come away with just one thing from this, it's that we really very much want to hear from you and help you and make this a very successful transition for the campus. Uh, with that, I will hand over to Karen Nicewender, who is our Senior Instructional Technology Support Specialist. Um, for short, we just call her Canvas Guru. And she has spent <laughs> countless hours working with instructors and others on our campus to help them make this transition and, and learn about the Canvas system. Karen? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, as Kelsey mentioned, it's, it's been my privilege to work with a bunch of instructors here on campus, um, particularly as we're working on the transition to Canvas. And what I'd like to do is kind of start to give you a little bit of a picture of what that actually looks like as far as kind of the volume and kind of an overall overview of that. So when you look at the numbers, I always like to start with the numbers. When you look at the numbers, you can kind of see a steady growth for Canvas adoption. Now what these percentages represent, the bars represent students, in at least one Canvas core space, and the line represents instructors in at least one Canvas core space. So you can see we started in the invitation-only pilot in spring 2015. We moved into um, the summer transition where we had some instructional designers working with faculty as they were getting their courses into Canvas. And then we moved into an Opus Canvas, open campus pilot <laughs> um, where anybody who wanted to opt in could start using the Canvas tools. At the end of winter 2016, the campus decided that we wanted to go ahead and make the full transition into Canvas and begin that process. So now you can see in our first year of adoption, a significant increase in the numbers. All right, so this kind of gives you a feel for the numbers and the quantity that we have in Canvas. But this is only part of the picture. Yeah? How does this compare to regular Triple E users? Um, because we are transitioning, um, there are, actually let me back up. Every course has tools available on Tripoli, and instructors use one or more of those tools. So a comparison between the two is a little bit challenging because a lot of instructors might, for example, use only the class mail list on Tripoli. Um, many of our instructors, the a vast majority of our instructors are on Tripoli and using at least one of those tools. So the instructor bar is going to be significantly higher for Tripoli. So in addition to the numbers, there's also that practical picture. Right, what do these things actually look like? What do these courses actually look like? And there's a number of different levels that our instructors are using Canvas at. Some of them are starting very simple with Canvas. And they're saying, I use files in my courses. I'm just gonna transition those into a Canvas course space. Okay, maybe they're saying I use discussions in Tripoli. I'm gonna try the discussions in Canvas just to kind of get their feet wet, see how things work, see what the system feels like. There are others who take a more all-in approach <laughs> and they start to play with some of the more advanced functionality. And that advanced functionality can be anything from a peer review assignment where you let Canvas do some of the technology behind that peer review. It can also include things like group work, which is something that we don't have support for on Tripoli, but we do have support for in Canvas. So some of our instructors have been exploring that. Um, and one of the fun ones, if you're teaching a foreign language course, you can actually translate your entire course into a different foreign language. So for example, Japanese or German or other languages. So that's a fun one. Effectively, our instructors are starting with Canvas, seeing kind of what it can do for them, and then they kind of dig in a little more. So let's talk about how our office and OIT has been facilitating this transition. The first thing is we've brought in more help. 
Um, when you guys walked in the door, you guys met our two Canvas, Trans our Canvas Transition Support Specialist, Eric Kelly and Stephanie Wiga. Um, they were brought in, they've gone through a Canvas boot camp, and they're now answering emails and um, phone. You can see the chart on the right shows you kind of a quantity of how many support interactions we have. There's obviously peaks near the beginning of the terms. Um, but Eric and Stephanie have been incredibly helpful in making sure that we can manage all the questions and all the traffic that's happening around Canvas. We've also developed a number of different resources. So we have things like regularly scheduled workshops. We have documentation in the Help Center. Um, we try to get information to you where you guys need it. So if there are ways that we can provide you with more information, maybe some video, maybe some documentation, maybe some customized workshops for your groups, please let us know. We're more than happy to work with you to make sure that you guys have what you need. And we put all kinds of information on the web. So one of the first places you can go is the Canvas transition site. We keep this updated pretty regularly. Um, information about what's happening to tools on Triple E, information about events such as this, and some basic information about Canvas as well. We've also modified the Triple E homepage. So now you can see there's a table that gives you kind of the status of the tools, when they're going to be trans or when they're going to be transitioning, when we have that information, and where they're going to be transitioning to. Within each of the tools on Triple E, there's now an informational banner. So let's say you're a heavy sign-up sheet user and you go to sign-up sheet, you'll see that banner in the top of the window. You can click on that and get more information specifically about sign-up sheet or whatever tool you're in at the moment. Again, we would love to make sure that you guys have the information that you want. So please do contact us. If you're confused about things, if you went to look for information and you couldn't find it easily, let us know because we want to remedy that situation and make sure that you have the information that you need. The thing that we've said throughout the pilot, and it holds true even to today, we're looking for the good, the bad, and the noteworthy. That could be something as simple as, I love this tool, it's awesome. Or, this was super confusing. I figured it out, but it took me an hour and I had to read five different documents and it was just annoying. Those kinds of things are important for us to know, because those are ways that we might be able to step in and mitigate some of the problems. Um, sometimes there are going to be issues that you share with us that are going to be super complex and they're not things that we can modify directly. We work really hard to give you workarounds. So if you can't necessarily do exactly what you need to do, we can find a way to make that happen. But sometimes the answer is unfortunately going to be we're going to have to share that feedback with somebody who can make the change. Speaking of which, there are a few things that we are continuing to watch. We've all probably heard the rumors about the grade book. <laughs> Um, put simply, the Triple E gradebook was designed for you guys. It was designed for our campus and it's been kept that way for a number of years. So there's some differences between the Triple E gradebook and the Canvas gradebook. Now, the most important thing on this slide is the bottom part. If there are things that you're doing in, grade, in your Triple E gradebook that are really useful and really important to you, please let us know because we are keeping that documentation so we can keep track of things. The longer story is, in some cases, we are working with you to find workarounds for ways to do it. In other cases, we're documenting what our campus needs because we need to know if the Canvas gradebook will fulfill those needs or if we need to be looking at other tools that we could potentially plug in. Speaking of which, one of the biggest issues right now that our instructors frequently encounter is student ID numbers in the gradebook. There are a number of reasons for this not the least of which is every user in Canvas needs to have an ID and an instructor won't have a student ID. Right, so there's a field there that needs to get filled in with something. Um, to put it simply, we've taken a, a three-pronged approach to this. The first is we've worked to get in between the problem and Canvas. So there's a tool now that you can use to transition your grades into a Canvas-friendly format. So you can import that into your gradebook. The second thing that we've done is we've talked a lot to Canvas about this. We've shared with them the situation. We've explained why it's a problem. We've worked with other universities who are experiencing similar problems to have that combined in that shared voice. And the third thing, again, we're collecting that feedback because we need to know how we're going to adjust to this and how we're going to make things work for our campus. Speaking of which, what is happening to Tripoli? 
Hello. The Office of Information Technology is undergoing a significant amount of planning for the future of Tripoli. What that means in practical terms is we know that the Tripoli system is going to need to change. Some of the tools are going to need to be less used on Tripoli and more used on Canvas. For example, quizzes, right? The Canvas system has a, a very good quiz tool. It doesn't make sense for us to maintain a quiz tool on Tripoli alongside a quiz tool on Canvas. So what we're doing is we're starting by developing a plan. And that plan at the moment looks like what we're going to need to do, all the milestones that are going to need to happen before a tool can be retired. What that will look like in practical terms for you is once we're at the point where we're ready to start looking at individual tools, you will hear from us a year before that tool is going to be retired. That year's lead time will give us enough time to do things like a statistical analysis of who's using the tool. How are they using it? Will the alternatives that we have meet those needs? It will also let us reach out to individual instructors, give them some heads up, give them some information about this tool. There are a number of different things that we're going to be planning along the way. In addition to plans for each individual tool, we're looking at kind of the big overall plan. Planning for a number of years for this multi-year transition to take place. As we have more specifics, you will hear more from our team. Watch for more information about this, particularly in the spring quarter, as things are going to start to be um, more available. The other things that we're doing is we're looking at external tools. So in addition, for our, in addition to our team actually retiring tools, we want to give you some new tools as well. And some of these look like external tools. So it's things like roll call or big blue button or turn it in or eye clicker. We're also working on some pilots of additional third party tools that are limited in scope. So things like Yellow Dig, which is available to Mirage, um, Sapling, which is available in chemistry, and Quizlet, which is actually available campus wide. So some of the things that we are working on and developing right now. One of the things that Canvas recently provided is a new people card. Okay, this is a quick and easy way for you to get, get at information about the students in your course. Any place where you see a student's name, you can click on the people card and get at things like their current grade. Quickly access the analytics about that student um, and see the, the grades on their last 10 items. Again, we're looking at third-party tools. Right now, we're doing a pilot of Quizlet, which effectively is an online flashcard system or a quizzing system. So it's something that instructors can go in through the rich content editor, identify the flashcard system, and then when students go to the, to the page in the Canvas system, they'll see something that says a, a term, and then they can click a, a link to see the definition of that term or whatever the, the instructor has created when they created that Quizlet. And the other thing that our team is actively developing right now is a new midterm feedback form. So this is going to be available um, probably as a pilot beginning in spring. Um, and this is going to give you uh, the ability to do customized midterm evaluations. Um, again, you will see more from us about this, but this just gives you a preview. We do have some documentation available in the Help Center on the new tool. And this is a, a screenshot of what the midterm feedback forms are going to look like. So with that, I'm going to take a seat, and we'll start with our instructor introductions. Thanks, Karen. I don't know if we're clapping or not. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Amalia Hermann. I'm a continuing lecturer in Humanities Core, where I also work on digital pedagogy tools, including this past year designing, coding, and maintaining a website-based system for instructors to share and archive instructional materials that they create. Uh, I first started Canvas uh, in the pilot, spring 2015, uh, and I'm trying to help instruct instructors on how best to use it. Uh, humanities Core is a thematically unified year-long introduction to the disciplines of the humanities. We enroll nearly 1,000 students each quarter and have around 40 instructors, lecturers, TAs, and Senate faculty. Uh, we have a unified lecture and reading curriculum. Students attend lectures that are delivered by a rotating team of faculty members. And then in writing seminars, for which we use Canvas, uh, students learn to think critically and write analytically about history, art history, literature, film, philosophy. 
Uh, our path to Canvas was certainly smoothed by an administrative decision for all our instructors to use Canvas starting in fall 2016. Uh, and so the feeling that we're all in it together, I think, has definitely helped us uh, work together to transition. Uh, the characteristics of our course that nicely match up with the tools available in Canvas are our focus on interdisciplinary discussion as well as strategically disciplinary methods. We do a lot of writing. Uh, students not only work on history essays, philosophy essays, art history essays, they also create their own blogs in which they engage in multimodal communication and also practice connecting what they learn in the course to what they experience in the world, or at least that's our aim there. Our year-long course culminates in a research project in which students analyze an object of their choice using the disciplinary methods that they have acquired over the course of the year. Okay. Hi, I'm Emily Brower, and I am a continuing lecturer in composition, and I also serve as the course director for one of our courses, which is 39B. And um, up until last year, I also served as our um, summer composition director, which oversaw all three of our, our writing courses, writing 39A, B, and C. I've also done a little work as an instructional designer with the Division of Teaching and Learning, so I've seen other uses of how Canvas has been on our campus as well. So that gives you a, a wide background. Um, I started using Canvas in winter 2013 through an ILTI course of 39A that we were using, and that's how I was introduced to Canvas. I immediately <laughs> fell in love with it, loved it, and kind of talked to our program quite a bit of how do we then bring it to our program. We were using a learning management system then called the Writing Studio, which is very particular and, and, and has some, some problems where Canvas alleviated a lot of those things. So it took us a while, but then our program, along with as Canvas being developed here on campus, um, we did some piloting, I believe it was um, spring 2015, and then all of us, our program um, adopted it in fall of 2015. Just to give you a little background on composition and what composition is about, um, so it's a year-long course sequence, like I said, 39A, B, and C. Students may um, test out of 39A and might only take 39B and C. These are, again, writing-intensive courses. We're usually handling the students that aren't in humanities core, so these are the students that are mostly social sciences, science-based, um, and, and have a little bit more background in that. So we're looking at projects that help them really determine how they might write throughout any of their courses on campus, as well as how they can really work in terms of their research projects and teaching them research and information literacy. So that's part of our goals. Um, we have TAs from various departments, and we have um, usually 30 new TAs that we have to instruct every year and bring them on board and teach them about Canvas and our curriculum as well. We have probably about 500 sections every year of 39A, B, and C. So we're quite a large program in terms of that. Um, in terms, we've had a lot of administrative support in our transition to Canvas, and we've been very, um, very interested in that. We've worked very closely with um, OIT and and talking to them about that and how to to best manage <laughs> to best manage that. Um, our characteristics um, again, heavy writing. We have a lot of um, tools where, and we do a lot of peer review. So that's one thing. We also really encourage multimodality, and we're teaching our students how to use um, various modes, particularly probably the most the um, mostly images and how to use images. And then we also have an e-portfolio capstone option. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later in detail about the e-portfolios that Canvas has. Hi, I'm Victoria Nam, and I represent the Academic English Program. Um, academic English Program service majority, our students are 1.5 generation or international students where their first language might not be English. So our program goal is to prepare undergraduate students for a proficiency in language so that they could be successful in all of their undergra other undergraduate classes. Um, our program is an year-long course sequence. We have 20A through 20D. 
some students can could be placed at 20A and they start from 28 and they have to go through till 20C and then once they finish that, they, then they are ready for composition. Um, some students could be placed directly at 20C and just get a one quarter of 20C and then could go to composition. <laughs> um, our program doesn't just service um, language proficiency, but we do have um, not just for writing um, emphasis, but for their reading skills, their speaking skills, so that these students could be definitely be ready for all 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 courses. Um, our program transitioned to Canvas before that. Similar similarly to composition program, we use what's called Writing Studio, and that software, that program management, it, it takes a lot of um, there's a lot of learning curve, so it, it was very difficult to convince our instructors now that they have managed the system to now turn to Canvas, <laughs> but we've managed um, and we adopted this fall because we had 20 new instructors coming in, so it was much easier to introduce Canvas, a new software that they didn't have to, they, that they would learn that they didn't have to learn before. So it was much smoother tra transition. But of course, there had to be some foundational um, work from administrative perspective to prepare the new instructors and the new um, continuing instructors. So speaking of which, um, all of you have played a role in getting your course spaces up for your other instructors in your courses. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, uh, because we have a lot of material to cover in our eight credit course, we decided to help instructors, help instructors save time by pre-making what we call templates. By templates, we mean a set of content in Canvas already made for instructors teaching the same curriculum. That includes pages already set up for them, assignments set up, rubrics for the various assignments, a help document for students and some images. Uh, so a lot of instructors felt uncomfortable starting with a new tool by setting it up with the help of EEE. Uh, instructors could either request to have a course space pre-filled with this content or they could create their own and import this template that we had created for them and then they could edit it, customize it for themselves. So we have a very similar thing. We have a lot of new instructors that we might be training, but we also had, uh, starting out, a lot of instructors that had been building their own. So we gave them, again, the option of if they wanted to kind of look and build their own, they could do that. If not, um, all of our new, new instructors, um, we have, again, those 39, uh, or sorry, 30 um, new TAs. We will give them a course shell based on a theme. They, we have different themes that, that our instructors can then teach with, or then after a while they can end up developing their own but for, for starting we give them that and again we give them a course we call it a course shell but it's the same thing a course shell or a course template and this is pre-populated for them based on our curriculum and it has all of the needs it has their lesson plans it helps them kind of look through that and one of the great things too is that the module option in um, Canvas allows for you to hide some things so it can just be viewed by the instructor versus the students and so we're allowed to leave notes there and kind of talk to them about those things and, and what they might need to do or, or where they need to adjust things or customize them as, as they need to. And then, and, okay, sorry. Um, our program did exactly what they did. We created a Canvas shell for each level, 20A, 20B, 20C, and 20D, where instructors can just import a, a copy already made with all of their grade book already in, um, recorded assignments, customized files, whatever they would need it was already there. So that instructors, when they just import it through their Canvas, they could customize it on their own. So they could just change the calendar just to change the assignment due dates. So 
to get their feet wet, it was a lot easier for them to um, navigate. They didn't have to really fully understand how to use it, but as long as they had all the basic tools there, they could just kind of play with it and felt a lot comfortable navigating Canvas. And then so basically based on that, um, our, our instructors usually um, use the template their first term, they customize as they go, and then once they choose to import it, they, ha they can then import their own course, and so they don't have to go back and readapt all of this. And so basically they, this kind of gives them like the training wheels to start, and then they are able to just take that and use that and have their own course as a template and design that and, and decide when they need to change things and when they don't. And having that template, they kind of understand if that works for their course and what could be better. So the next time when they're setting up their own canvas, they have a better idea how to make it better. Uh, in terms of the number of course spaces, that is canvas sites, uh, which an instructor can create or have created for them, EE affords us the opportunity to combine sections or seminars of the same course into one course space. Uh, I find that easier because I teach two seminars in a row, Tuesdays, Thursdays. Uh, where they have exactly the same curriculum. I give exactly the same assignments, so I can combine them in one course space. Alternatively, some instructors prefer to have one course space for each section or seminar. So the flexibility there is great. Uh, it does require some planning and organization in advance. This was a lesson we learned we did not think about the possible confusion over this option before we first experimented with it. Uh, we did learn that you, this option needs to be explained to instructors so they can make the best decision about what will work for them. Otherwise, you end up doing more work or having more work done for you in order to split or combine sections into one course space. So now you've got your instructors with a course space. How did you teach them how to use Canvas? Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of planning ahead of time. And even with a lot of planning, we still have many, many questions. So obviously, we created uh, helpful tips um, to use Canvas. And we send it to our instructors. We had to create a, a video clip of even how to import Canvas, right, to their Canvas, how to copy, export, um, so the video tools, step by step, of how importing, exporting, that helped be prepared to receive a lot of email and questions, right, and have conversations. I personally had to meet each instructor at least once because there were a lot of confusions, and what really helped uh, our program was that we scheduled a professional development and we did this uh, twice in each, uh, each quarter. And this workshop definitely helped because um, we had half of our instructors were very familiar with using Canvas, so they had advanced questions. And half of our instructors were newbies, so they had different set of questions. But when we had this uh, workshop, they got together and the advanced instructors could answer the newbies questions and Karen was there to answer the advanced questions. So having a lot of resources definitely, definitely helped. Speaking on that just for a minute, um, we also had a lot of orientations, and so our orientations at the beginning of our, of our, to our curriculum, we also deal with a lot of those kind of advanced questions, and it does seem to be like we start to split our instructors up with those advanced ones who want to use some of the more advanced tools in Canvas and how they start to do that, as well as then the new ones. And so we offer usually s several training sessions where it's like drop in, come bring your computer, work on your course, and then as you have questions, we will help you and help you kind of guide that. So I think that works pretty well for us. Um, also then in terms of the support perspective, um, 
I, OAT is always happy to help. One of the things that has happened since we our program's been using this a little bit longer, it's gotten a little easier, as well as I think the triple E support guide for Canvas has gotten more robust. So it becomes very nice that I can just send them to that and say, hey, look at this link, or look, they walk you step by step how, how to do this, and, and that's um, very nice. There are so, still some issues and things hap happen sometimes. For instance, um, the Turnitin, we've had some issues with the Turnitin integration and that's one of the things in obviously a writing course we love Turnitin we use Turnitin a lot and kind of looking at those sorts of things so there'll be small things that as you try to transport a course from one quarter to the next Turnitin won't necessarily play nice the next time around you have to do a few things um, but but those are small things and I think learning curve things and as we get that it's very easy for our instructors to then adapt and to look at that um, in terms of students students usually pick it up fairly easily they they can find um, their way around and navigate it and I think in in my experience using other learning management systems canvas seems quite nav it's it's very easy to navigate for them um, but there are some that are still kind of managing a changing technology or trying to find things and how to do that um, Sometimes it can be particularly challenging if they have to move back and forth between Triple E and Triple and Triple E Canvas. So having you having a very specific place, and if they can go to one place, it makes it a little bit easier for them if they're able to do that. Um, it is very easy for the students to report their links or broken tools. So. I, th I think that goes to, to Karen or somebody else over at Triple E um, very quickly, and it'll say, this isn't working or this isn't happening, and then they'll usually um, email you and say, hey, th this is the problem that's going on, or these are the things that we're finding. So sometimes our instructors, I think, get a little nervous about that because they feel like, oh, no, like I'm not doing something right. But usually it, it really is for informational purposes and just to let them know, hey, go back and fix that link or, or look at that. So our students get over anxious and try to get help wherever <laughs> instead of maybe just emailing the instructor. Um, Could I add, yeah. there is a learning curve even for students, right, especially for specific um, modules, quizzes. Once they, I, this is a sample student email. Once, you, when students, once a student clicks on that quiz and takes a look at it, it's open and they only have, we allowed only a certain time for them to finish. And once they click, they can't just close it. Once they close it, then the quiz is finished. So they would receive a zero. So there is a learning curve of using different um, uh, icons and even for instructors too. It's little, it has to be published for <laughs> Instructor physically has to publish in two different locations. So if it's not published correctly, then students are unable to see that assignment. So even though an instructor believes that I've published this assignment, this is due, sometimes students may not be able to see that. So that's another learning curve. So there could be little glitches here and there, so just be prepared. And I think, to me, I think Canvas has gotten better. Like, there'll be exceptions where, like, if I need to let a student take a quiz over again or something, you know, like, they did something where it's like, oh, yes, <laughs> obviously they just ran out of time. There, It does seem like there's, the more, I think, Canvas updates, the more I see that there's ways to manage some of those problems as well. Yeah, so yeah. with problems, Canvas is great because there are many ways to rectify, <laughs> remediate <laughs> those problems. So before other software that we used, once a student made a mistake or an instructor made a mistake, there was no going back. It was very difficult to change. But with Canvas, even though a student makes a mistake or even though an instructor makes a mistake, there are many other options to rectify that situation and very quickly and very easily. So that's probably one way that Canvas is probably um, very easy to use. Okay. So then um, moving on. Um, Canvas does change regularly, and sometimes I open up, a, open it up again. I'm like, what is the, you know, like what is this? There's something new, and trying to think that, or I think I've understood a problem or a limitation, and then that limitation goes away. And so some of that is just being able to kind of keep up with that, and, and they are they are fairly regular, and sometimes it takes me a, you know a while to find those or look at that, but. Um, approximately every three weeks and I do believe canvas has a way um, it talks about what is being updated and what's going on so you can kind of see oh maybe that was a problem that I had that I don't have to now deal with or something like that 
And Instructor does yeah. provide, the Instructor, the company that makes Canvas, uh, does provide a status feed on the software. Uh, we actually feed that into our Instructor's website so that at any moment, if an Instructor is having problems accessing Canvas, as many people had throughout the world <laughs> yesterday, uh, they can look at our own website and see, is it me or is the service down for everyone? So I know each of you took a slightly different approach to creating your course spaces in Canvas. Um, I'd love to take some time for each of you to kind of share your experiences. So let's start with Victoria and Quizzes. Yes. Um, there are a couple things that our program is heavily dependent on, but one of them is quizzes. Before Canvas, um, our program gave paper-based quizzes. So that means right now, currently, I think our program has about 40 instructors. So if we gave a paper-based quiz, could you imagine the copies that we have to make and for that preparation? So it took us 20, at least 20 minutes of teaching uh, hour to uh, conduct, to give this test. And it took another five to 10 minutes after that to give back the paper-based quiz and to review that. So we, this year, this fall quarter, try to alleviate some of those uh, copies by making those paper quizzes to Canvas quizzes. Um, we are learning. <laughs> um, the quiz, obviously, they could do it on their own. It doesn't take class time, so we have 20 more minutes, at least 30 more minutes of te that to be a teaching moment. Um, these quizzes are automatically graded, right? They know instantaneously what their score is, and that score is directly goes to their grade book, so I don't have to do anything. If a student had, a, had made a mistake and then emails me, hey, there was a problem with the question or there was a problem with the answer, because it is very sensitive. Um, if a student makes a spelling mistake, a capitalization mistake, a space mistake, then the computer will read it as incorrect. So it's easy, but however, it's very easy for an instructor to go to that quiz and fudge the numbers. So you could change the score in a matter of seconds and, and review um, students' work. So it probably saves a lot of time. So that's, it made it, it made it really um, fast and easy to grade and save time. But at the same token, it created other questionable actions. Um, could you imagine? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> um, obviously, when we gave paper-based quizzes, it was done in class, so an instructor could monitor, walk around, with, with Canvas quizzes, obviously they're doing it on their own, on their own time. <sighs> Some instructors uh, commented that this student took this quiz under two minutes. That would be physically impossible because it would take at least, even for a native speaker, at least 15 minutes to read the question. <laughs> so. There were some pros and cons, and this quarter, this is our second time uh, doing this, so we made a diff Canvas is, is great because on that, under that quiz, we're able to make two different versions of quiz. So when we give a quiz, a student could, some student could get a version one, the other person get a version two, so they might have a different version, so they might not be able to cheat, but then there were other questions, yes? So still doesn't address the issue who is actually doing the quiz, right? So uh, how, I mean, we run into this issue all the time, of course. So how, how do you handle that? Yeah, that is a tough question. So. I mean, we all like the convenience of doing it online, but of course, the, the academic honesty issue. Absolutely. I don't think has been fully addressed yet. So this time around, this quarter, we made online quizzes to weigh a little less than we, it used to be. It used to be it would be worth at least 10%. This time around, we did, our program decided, hey, we're gonna change that to only 5%. So the stake will be a little bit lower. That would be one way to address that. Yeah, and then with our students, I'm not very familiar, but would they take a screenshot? 
and they could pass it along. So there was another um, issue that we encountered. So that's why we're thinking about making a different versions, maybe not two, maybe three or four. <coughs> yeah, I think the questions of academic honesty are always going to be challenging, and particularly when you get into an electronic environment. Um, there, the, the issues are going to be there even in a in a face to face and in a in a paper quiz as well. Absolutely. So I think it's just a matter of using some different strategies. Um, some of the things that Victoria has mentioned are some of the really good ones. Um, there's also things you can do in Canvas, like making them time restricted, so hopefully they don't they aren't sitting on the quiz for a long time. Uh, making sure that they um, have to access it with a password or other things like that. There are a number of ways you can mitigate it. Um, but you're right, there are go always going to be issues of academic honesty with online quizzes. So we've decided as a program, we restricted the time and everybody, it's open only for one day for everyone. So it's not in multiple days. So that was another way to alleviate that. Um, are there any plans for Canvas to use anything like ProctorU or ProctorTrack for virtual proctoring? Um, some of our instructors do use ProctorU. Um, it is something that exists outside of Canvas, so they, they establish a contract, and I believe Janet is our contact on campus for using ProctorU. But yes, that is an option as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to writing assignments. So Amalia, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, we are a writing intensive course. So for each essay assignment, students work through several stages of pre-writing, research, drafting, peer review, revision. Before Canvas, uh, we had a somewhat unwieldy mix of multiple tools. Some instructors used eDropbox to collect assignments. Some used paper copies. We tried to run everything through the Turnitin originality check service. Uh, some instructors used Google Docs or Google Drive to collect assignments. Uh, this meant that students had to adjust themselves to the particular instructor they had each quarter because they might choose a different method of collection and return for assignments. Uh, especially grading blog posts was really inefficient. Uh, if we didn't have a blog roll of the sites students had created, uh, we had to look for them, students would sometimes communicate them over email or put them into a Microsoft Word document, which completely uh, contrasted the purpose of writing online. Uh, so our transition process uh, was extensive. Uh, we had to do a lot of planning in advance about which sort of assignment suited which sort of submission option by providing templates to instructors that already had the assignments set up we could save them a lot of time and kind of normalize the methods we used for certain kinds of assignments. So if a student wrote a blog post, they could simply paste in the URL, the website, for their assignment, and Canvas would provide a snapshot of their blog post right in the grade tool. We also built in our essay rubrics and blog rubrics into Canvas so the instructor could quickly uh, have an overview of those assessment categories and provide a grade. Uh, Speed Grader is Canvas's interface for the instructor to speedily, uh, mm -hmm. I think, but I would also say efficiently grade work that has been submitted online. Uh, it certainly has saved us a lot of time. We still get a lot of questions from instructors about how to use it effectively. Occasionally we encounter some bugs. Uh, once people rely on SpeedGrader, they like it so much that the occasional problems bother them a lot. <laughs> uh, so we've collected a lot of tip sheets, screencast videos, tricks that we can use and share to make the process easier. I think we have an example of, uh, this is a final essay submission. As I said, students have worked through at least four stages of writing before this. Having students submit the intermediary stages of writing online saves us a lot of time. I can provide feedback very quickly, and it makes our one-on-one -on -one essay consultations a lot more efficient. So when students get to the last stage here, uh, they are actually submitting their essays not only to Canvas, but also to the Turnitin originality check. And so I, the instructor, can then immediately see, well, five minute delay, let's say, uh, whether the Turnitin service has detected 
any plagiarism. Also, on the right-hand side here, I can see the rubric, which helps uh, normalize assessment criteria across all the seminars in our course. Um, we do often use a more holistic method of grading, but we try to provide these tools for instructors so that we're all using the same general assessment criteria. And Emily, I know composition does writing as well, but you do it slightly differently in e-portfolios? We do. We, we actually use a lot of the same things, and our students submit them on, you know, throughout the quarter, um, and we use SpeedGrader a lot, and that's something that our instructors really like. But one of the things that we've been asking our students to do is to take ownership and then to start to kind of talk about that and reflect about their writing process. And so in order to do that, we really like the portfolio because it allows them to put all of that work together, start to highlight what they're doing. Each course... Um, 39A, B, and C um, attacks it a little bit differently so the students kind of learn. But the other thing that this then does is it allows us to start thinking and being able to see how students are transferring these skills across courses as well. So there, there's multiple reasons for kind of the e-portfolios and what we're doing. Before Canvas, um, when we started portfolios, there would sometimes be, we were old school paper portfolios in, bi in binders and you would see our instructors carrying thousands of binders <laughs> to their car um, quite often. Or we would do um, so some instructors would do Word documents and submit them near the end of the term. But again, these didn't really allow for some of the design things that we're trying to teach our students, as well as multimodality and how to incorporate images, screenshots of their work and things like that. So um, we, would, we would add comments that were added and then return to the students. So the students would still have a collection of their own work, but it, was, it wasn't quite the same and it didn't allow for kind of that process of us to look at that as well. So. As we started to transition, once we went to Canvas, we realized that the ePortfolio tool there would work pretty well for us. It's not perfect. There are still things that I think we wish it would do a little bit more and allow for a little bit more flexibility for our students. But overall, it, it accomplishes most of the needs um, that we need. Um, one of the things, as we were starting to look at this and starting to figure that out, a lot of our instructors were very worried of, how do I teach this to my students because um, I don't know how it works. I don't understand this e-portfolio. So one of the things was we really kind of tried to develop and let them play with the tool as well. And for our new instructors that we're training, they actually, as part of one of their courses, they have to create an e-portfolio tool too so that they get experience and know what their um, students have to kind of accomplish as well. Um, we also developed a lot of documentation for our students, um, how to for the technology, ways to incorporate media that that were a little bit more um, specific, as well as kind of we model a lot in our classes, embedding submissions into a portfolio, how does it work, what are all the aspects of the tool that we can do. One of the things, some of our instructors, we feel obviously that we have so much to do in a class that they didn't want to take time really teaching them all of that technology, so we developed an instructional video, and I should say I developed the instructional video, <laughs> but um, Instructors seem to use that pretty much primarily. They, they'll say, like, just use Emily's video. And everybody's like, but no. And they're like, no, it will create, like, the students will know how to do that. So, um, it, and it's a very basic step-by-step. -step. I'm sure Canvas has maybe a better video now that I can <laughs> link them to. But it just takes them step-by-step -step through, like, the creation process. And our instructors then don't have to spend the time in class talking to them about that as much. Um, one of the things with the ePortfolio that's a little bit bothersome for us is that it's not like an assignment where you can see it in speed grader. The links actually live with the students. They don't live with a course. So what happens is that students, the way that it's set up is they have to go and find and create their ePortfolio based on like their personal account. So they have to then take those links and share them somehow with the instructor. So we ran into some problems with that, but now we've kind of developed a system in SpeedGrader where they just put the link in SpeedGrader and we can see that and have access to it. But th there are some, a little bit of, I guess, finicky rules there in terms of that. I, I wish it would just be like if they create one, I would be able to see it, but um, 
for right now that it's not a horrible um, workaround. And then I think I have a few examples up here from my students. Um, you'll see that they they like to add a lot of multimodality in. They talk a little bit about their process. One of my students was writing um, a little bit about Plato's Cave, and he brings in um, you know a comic about that and talking about that and, and looking at that. You'll see that we actually really try to start teaching them ideas of organization in terms of section. They have sections as well as they have um, pages within those sections so we really start to kind of teach them thinking about um, creating those and, and how you organize things um, in, in a different way I mean similar to how you organize papers as well um, and then this one you can start to see there's a little bit of students bringing in the rubric students bringing in things of, of what they're talking about in terms of their writing process so it allows them a lot of that and what happens to the portfolio that with the series um, the portfolios stay in Canvas with our links, so we have them. We haven't yet, so the students can keep them, and the students also have them, so they can always go back and reflect on them or pull them or pull their work you know, from those, again, if they need to or to use it as a sample. We haven't yet done anything to like maybe cultivate all of them to see what has happened like across 39A, B, and C, but I, that's something that we're starting to think about and consider. One thing we might think about is extending portfolio into the junior and senior years and right. um, creating it as a place where they take bringing stuff from a variety of different departments and create something that then could be something presentable to a future employer. Yeah. And, yeah. and so one of the questions is how do we preserve student records beyond their graduation and how long does access continue? And that's been something we've been start, sort of talking with Karen as well and, and OIT because those are things of how long can we have this because one for sometimes for our use as the department we want to be able to access things that have been um, done quite a while ago as well as can our students then access them as well because I think that is something we'd like them to think about as a possible tool that they could use. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a policy issue that we'll be putting more refinement on it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right, so we've heard about grades in Canvas. Let's talk about how all the programs handle the grades in the system. Uh, so Humanities Core relied very much on the EEE grade books because of the unique pedagogical structure or organization of our course into small writing seminars and large lectures. We needed two grade books per seminar and EE was, still works quite well in that regard. Uh, now with Canvas, uh, we really appreciate being able to let students know their grades on smaller homework assignments, participation, writing. Canvas only allows us to make one grade book per seminar, however, so we've had some workarounds and we're still at this time relying on the EE grade books. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, so basically, before Canvas, um, we submitted um, the course directors submit the grades for the instructors, and we submitted them um, to the registrar um, for for our instructors. And scores were required to be in Triple E. Right now, um, we do the we do the same thing. Um, assignment scores are released through Canvas. A lot of our instructors release some of them through Canvas, and we're kind of in this mix spot where some instructors are using Canvas, some instructors are using Triple E, and we're allowing them the option because we've started, I experimented last summer with allowing them the option and giving, I had about probably 65 instructors and only two of them took the option to use Canvas. And so that said something to me of starting to think, there's some, and it's more work for them to transfer it to Triple E. Like they actually have to physically plug in those grades and to do that. And so with that, I was like, wow, they're choosing the option of a little bit more work. What, what is it that they like about Triple E? And I, I'm not sure I have that answer yet, but it still seems to, to me that my instructors prefer the Triple E grade book. I think there's something about perhaps there's a little bit more um, ways for instructors to kind of hide things, to show things, to look at those and monitor that on Triple E that they haven't yet been able to do in Canvas. And so that's why I think we have that preference still. The, we're slowly moving more and more towards Canvas and a lot of them do that. So um, we're getting there, but not quite there yet. 
Well, we've used Triple E Gradebook before, but now that we are 100% on Canvas, um, the shell, the template we created, we created with all of their assignments already in there. So their gradebook is automatically created. So it was very easy for our instructors to adopt to Canvas Gradebook. The only problem I've had has been solved <laughs> because Canvas is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. We rely heavily on conferences. So we have at least two conferences per quarter with each student. And every time we meet with a student, we like to see the gradebook and to make sure they are on the same page. But it was before, it was really time consuming to see the individual student view and their speed grader and their assignment. So it was going back and forth, back and forth. But now with the grade book, you have a student's name. We just click in there and it gives you all, everything. So I could just automatically click to the assignment and say, hey, this is what you got. And then I could go back to the other assignment. So it's very, fairly simple with the new change. So now it's time for us to uh, vent a bit about <laughs> our uh, <laughs> Concerns with uh, some options in the Canvas gradebook. Uh, Canvas offers what it calls muting. Muting is Canvas speak for making grades not visible to students. I don't know why they changed the metaphor from vision to hearing, but uh, muting makes <laughs> grades not visible to students. Uh, so that as an instructor, as I'm going through a set of essays, I can wait until I have entered the grades for all of the essays before releasing them to the students. Uh, it's a great tool. It is not on by default. So if I have to remember to click mute, otherwise the student will see the grade as soon as I enter one of them, and then the later student will ask me why I have not graded their essay yet. And sometimes it gets problematic if you forget, if you mute or un as soon as you unmute, your students get a notification that a grade's been released. And sometimes I've made a mistake and then I mute it back and then I get many emails saying, where is my grade? You said you, re you, know, you released it. So it's some of those not automatic notifications that can get problematic. Um, the one other, I talked a little bit about hiding numbers or letters or grades, and I think part of that also is, I call it the scroll of death, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is this lovely, like, long, long thing. And when you have a lot of assignments, like you do in writing classes, as you should probably should in writing classes, um, it just gets really, really hard to kind of search for the things. And even though you have maybe larger, like, I would love it if the larger categories were the only things shown and not just all these little individual assignments, because... I, or have options to toggle between the two um, and looking at that. So I think that's probably my big thing. I don't know if there's... Yeah, and I think this one we talked about a little bit earlier, but this one um, was one of the experiences that particularly academic English experienced as well. All right, so let's talk some odds and ends with Canvas. Uh, Turnitin can be challenging, I'd say mostly to instructors, not so much to uh, students. Uh, our instructors who have been in the course for a while are used to going to another website, turnitin.com. Uh, now the Turnitin tool as a third party service is built into Canvas, uh, which should be much easier. Uh, sometimes that integration is not perfect. Uh, and when instructors encounter problems, they don't know how to solve them. Uh, so we try to anticipate those issues. Uh, when we set up Turnitin enabled assignments for instructors in the template, we have to remind them to re-save, that is to trigger the integration of Turnitin for their particular set of students. So planning, organizing, providing a lot of reminders to instructors of how to avoid problems in the first place is very helpful. Um, yes, because it's built, Turnitin is built in, our program is heavily, heavily dependent on Turnitin, but as you can see on Canvas, there are many options for the due date, right? So you could be due date, but you could be available for this hour. So Canvas is great in that it gives you many options. However, when it goes to Turnitin.com, it doesn't really read exactly like Canvas. So even though I made it available to 250, this is my when this is when the class starts. So on Canvas, instead of being 250, it says 1230. So 
there is a miscommunication between this due date and Canvas. So it doesn't automatically register. So there's some confusion with students, like I can't turn it in, it's not available, because turnitin.com said no, time is over. So there are little things like that that could be a, a, of a glitch where students are panicking and emails are coming in. So um, you have to be careful about Turnitin and Canvas. Sorry, can you just start clarify? Is it just like there's an opening time and then a closing time for the assignment? Yes. And, and Turnitin on Canvas only recognizes the opening time? I mean, why couldn't it, you, you cannot see you can't adjust to the closing time or something, or what's the, I don't, I don't, I'm not clear on this. Yes, so my class starts at 12.30, so it used to be when students brought paper, you know, paper copies, they have to bring it by 12.30. So I'm hoping that all students have submitted their submission by 12.30. But sometimes there is a, a glitch with their computer, they can't print it, so I give them at least a couple of hours to upload it to turnitin.com. Right? Yes, but it should be d done by 12.30. Well, so, if you, I mean, if you just set the deadline at the same time, then... Then it will be resolved. Yeah, that I did not think about. <laughs> <laughs> so, when it went to turnin.com, turnin.com only recognized the due date, that 12.30 hour, and it didn't change for availability. Sir, one other question. So, does this turn it in... Well, it, it just it simply does not accept the assignment at all? Because, like, for example, with Dropbox, you can submit it late, and then it works it as late. Exactly. Okay. I should actually clarify one thing on here. There, yeah, there, there are a number of options that you can configure in a Turnitin assignment. Um, what Victoria's describing here is that Canvas allows you to have a Turnitin window that may right. extend beyond the due date. Turnitin has basically a due date or a due date and infinity. Right, so it's it's either you will always accept late assignments or you will never accept late assignments. So it's it's a yes or no. But, on but that. it doesn't mark the late assignment. It does. Oh, okay. Yes. So yeah. that's an extra extra step through Canvas, and then you got to go to setting, and then check the turn it in setting, and then so that's an extra step for instructors, and some instructors don't know. So yeah, and you can you can set that for all of your course, all of your assignments. You can set a default and then update your settings for all of your assignments. So I'm going to talk a little bit about support for conferences. Um, our, our instructors, particularly those of uh, us who teach online um, over the summer is, is the majority of when our composition classes are taught online. We use conferences and we use um, the tool with, some of us use the tool within Canvas, um, Big Blue Button. So it, it allows for um, one-on-one -on -one consultations and allowing students to do that. At the beginning, sometimes it depends, I think, on how well both your and your student's internet connection is as to how well the conferencing tool works. But if it is fairly successful, then Big Blue Button does not have too many problems in terms of that. It's really nice because, as you can kind of see up here, um, you'll see who's who's in there and who's kind of talking with you. You can set up a webcam. You can set up audio. You can pull up a student's um, assignment and go over it with them, marking it up as they go or looking at that. You can do individual chats or have group chats if you want to have several students in there working on different things and kind of monitoring them or have them for office hours. So because we do a lot of conferences and one-on-one -on -one work, that's something that was very helpful for us um, in terms of, of that idea. So um, one thing is like you can't, you could possibly then like try to integrate um, all of this in like a sort of a custom speed grader interface so it would be easier to have that kind of pop up and, and look at that but right now it, it, it seems to work fairly well and our instructors seem to use that they'll use they will use other tools as well but this is one option that's available to them oh, our program is heavily dependent on conferencing as well um, so to prepare for this conferences, we would have a sign-up sheet. Um, before Canvas, we would use Sign Up Genius to create a sign-up sheet, and that would take at least 20 minutes. But with Canvas, there's a built-in scheduler, and you can create. You don't have to go take that extra step and sign up with Sign Up Genius. 
you can create a scheduler directly here, and it's it goes it's connected directly to their uh, calendar, so everybody will can see the available hours, what's taken. So it has saved me at least I don't know 30 minutes per class. So it's a terrific tool. All right, on this one, just a quick question. So what happens when the student inevitably doesn't show up on time or? Uh, they just have to find another slot. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one of the things that we find very helpful for us is we build a lot of our courses a little bit earlier, and sometimes it depends on, on um, how soon those sandboxes are open, or, or sorry, or how soon those courses are open in Tripoli and looking at that. So one of the things as we're designing curriculum or thinking about curriculum and thinking about those changes is to be able to have a sandbox, So which we all do as instructors here. There, there's a sandbox to try things out and to kind of look at that. Um, and, and so it's nice to let, to let our um, instructors learn that. One of the things that becomes problem a little bit pro programmatically for us. For instance, when um, I'm looking at designing 39A courses, B courses, and C courses, and have all of these templates, I, unfortunately, if I only have one sandbox, I'm not able to then like import all of those. So I have to get a little creative, <laughs> creative in how to solve those. So that would be my if it, it would be nice if I had more more sandboxes to play with. That might be only for a few people, but. <laughs> But you can go straight into Canvas and sign up for a free site. Right? Yeah, that's so you yes. Have a different email, and then right. you can set them up and download them and do that. But but I would love to not have to switch between two different things. I would love to ha not have to switch between free teacher versus the other one. I mean, that's how I do it. But I think that's an extra step that <laughs> that yeah. if I had more the sandboxes, I wouldn't have to. Yeah. Um. I don't know if you guys are aware of what Sandbox is. Yes, yeah, it's a great tool for, especially for us, to um, think ahead for the next quarter and test out what works and what doesn't work. So um, right now we're thinking about, in our program, it is very difficult to um, cancel class. If an instructor is sick, we have to really look for a sub and to make sure that class continues. and. So we're thinking about creating a sandbox course just for that level, so that if an instructor is sick or anything happens, we would have this as an online course. So it's another way to test out and see, and I'll hopefully be invited next year and we'll explain what happened. <laughs> so, and one of the other things I actually should say about the sandboxes is if you have a sandbox, then I can invite other instructors to that and they can then export this versus me having to send them a large file and things like that. So in terms of like portability and looking at modules and things that some of my instructors could kind of port some things in and out, like a sandbox that would allow for different levels of that would be very helpful. And, and just to clarify, the, um, at the moment, the sandbox is, is really just a fully functioning Canvas course space that you and only you have access to. So it lets you go in and create quizzes and assignments and pages and play with things and see how they work. Um, right now they're not shareable with other instructors and right now you as an instructor only get one. Um, but this is exactly the kind of feedback that, that we were talking about earlier that if you guys can let us know some of the things that you need, this helps inform our team as far as the things that we can do and the things that we can look out for the future. They are not. All right, so each of you guys have been in Canvas for a while. So I asked you that famous question. If you were talking to a new instructor who had never used Canvas before, what would you say to them? Um, and these are some of the things you guys shared, so. Yeah, plan on spending some time to explore. Um, like I said, I've waited <laughs> as long as I could to adopt Canvas. I knew that it was going to take, uh, before Canvas, we used a tool called Writing Studio. And it took me at least three, four, five hours to set this up um, for the quarter. And I thought, oh my gosh, now I'm finally understanding this. I have to adopt to another one. So I waited until long as I could. But once I adopted, oh my gosh, is it so much better than what I <laughs> was using? So, yeah, you just need time to just kind of play with the tools 
but having that template, mm -hmm. I think definitely helps because you're more comfortable with, you know, having that available, so to clicking and playing with it, so it, it, it was a lot easier for other instructors. And Amalia's words of wisdom? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd really encourage you to either provide or look at examples of what's possible. A lot of our instructors think they are intimidated by technology, uh, but once they can see a specific concrete example created by a colleague, rather than fearing the vague abstraction, they become a lot more comfortable with trying it out themselves. And I think one of my pieces of advice is that you don't have to, I think usually instructors see it and they see that long list of all the tools on the side and they're like, I have to figure out everything. Um, and I usually tell them, no, you only have to figure out a few. Let's use the ones that you think you're really going to have to use and, and kind of be selective with that and what you're using. And as they get more comfortable, then you can start importing this. And my advice is always use modules. Um, <laughs> and one of that is our instructors being on the other learning management system, they just wanted to use the calendar tool that's in there and kind of create from the calendar, which is not a good way of porting it af quarter after quarter. And we they learned that very quickly, um, quarter after quarter. So it's basically kind of starting with that and using those modules to kind of build build that for a longer time. The final one that kind of encapsulated a couple of different uh, sentiments was actually from Victoria. So we'll give you guys a minute to read that because I know it's a longer one. Yeah, if you're a beginner, you can start using simple things, mm -hmm. files, calendar, assignments. Um, yeah, but once you get your feet wet and you discover, oh my gosh, this could be better. So there are more options as you get better and better. Um, you could, I think, use it in more advanced setting. And the more I learn about Canvas, I realize the more I can learn. There's more options available. So I'm always, always learning. So with that, we will open it up if there's any questions. Can uh, sandboxes once hidden with, they be published? They, they can be exported, so you have to export them, but you can export them into whatever class you want, and then they can be published from there. And one other quick question. Uh, do different schools have a assigned individual who generates these uh, templates? Uh, modules that the rest of the faculty can build off of? I mean, can you force a faculty member to do that? <laughs> that probably is up to individual schools, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so let me um, repeat the question just for the record as well. Um, so the question is, do other schools have folks like these three who are creating course spaces that we can make available to some of the instructors? Um, at the moment, that's kind of hit and miss. Some schools do, some schools don't. Um, if you're curious in some, about some of the resources that are available, come talk to us and we could potentially connect you with some of the folks who might be appropriate. One of the projects that um, is kind of on my wish list that I will eventually be able to complete um, is having a list of some courses that instructors have said, I want to make this course public so others can see what I've done. So that will help with some of the things that Amalia is talking about because then you can go in and kind of see them. Um, and then there might be some, some other ways that, that the various schools can help. So, the short answer to the question at the moment is there isn't one individual person who's listed for each school, um, but come talk to us and we can connect you with folks who might be able to help. Yes. So I'm on from the other side of the campus, I'm from engineering, and much of this is probably not applicable to us because we don't do so much writing. But uh, I have a question, uh, we have a saying in engineering, never change a running system. So if the uh, digital E is actually an excellent system in our way, so we should not fix what's, what's not, not broken. broken. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned that we want to keep the existing infrastructure that we are all used to and where we need to invest zero time to get running and do our classes and then uh, don't spend time figuring out which button to press. So I'll 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 my big question is, how long can we keep this alive? And yeah. <laughs> 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 the next 20 years until I go oh, to <laughs> 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 Um, and we are still running code from the 90s. Uh, it was started when there wasn't something you could buy. There weren't products like this on the shelf. And it's, we've been very proud of what we've accomplished with EE. It's worked really well for a long time. 
The problem is it's become increasingly difficult to keep it running and keep it sustainable. It's a very challenging system for us to build as a campus with the resources that we have. So we sort of took the perspective that if this was a car, and this car was starting to show some troubles, and we were really trying to make sure all the passengers didn't see the problems, they felt comfortable, the ride was smooth, we'd rather buy a new car before we're standing on the side of the road calling AAA uh, than wait for that car to break down. So EE is working, and our goal is to make a transition to something new while it's still working. And while you can, continue to use the things that you need and talk to us and make this a gentle transition and process over several years, rather than getting to the point where we can't sustain that system, because it really does have some significant problems. Uh, and some challenges for us in terms of the hardware footprint that we're supporting, the cost of keeping that up and running. And beyond that, we were beginning to get more and more requests for things that we couldn't give the campus with EDE. Uh, integrations with third-party services, or support for group uh, access, or courses that were kind of off the typical schedule, things that didn't have a registrar by digital course code. And we're bound by a lot of the decisions that we made that made a lot of sense at the time over the last 20 years uh, that limited some of the ways we could expand and open the system up. So a few years ago, we actually convened a group to say, you know, we're seeing these problems in the future, what should we do? Um, and initially, we decided we should rebuild the EE ground up, because we think we have the best thing. We think we can do this really well. We went away, we looked at what that would take, and we realized we were talking about three to five years where the campus would not see improvements. We'd be working on getting that back end up and running and making a lot of changes that wouldn't deliver something new or better, would just sustain what we currently have. Meanwhile, we're chasing a moving target. Uh, we're seeing products like Canvas come out that can do new and innovative things. We've got a campus that is coming to us and clamoring for access to some of these things, and we would just be catching up. So we really love EEE, we're very proud of EEE, um, and we are still a development team, and we are still going to build custom things for this campus, things that we can't buy, like our campus's evaluation system. Uh, but we think that the best and most feasible way for us to continue to have something that's up and running and working when Amazon Web Services doesn't go down on these codes, uh, <laughs> it is for us to have a blended ecosystem where Canvas is at the core of it, Canvas provides the things that we can buy, things like a quiz tool um, that's, that's pretty typical across different campuses, a lot of common functionality, but we build the things that are unique to our campus, and we work with the vendor to help them improve Canvas and make it better. So I, I know that this is difficult, I know it's no fun to have to make a change when stuff is working, uh, but our goal is to really make this as gentle of a process as possible, a process that we do a lot of collaboration and conversation and help, not something we just impose or have happen overnight. Uh, you know, that this isn't um, an instant process. This is gonna be several more years where we continue to come out and do events like this and talk to you and learn what's working and what's not, where we are on the phone with the vendor a whole lot, we're talking to our sister campuses and other uh, campuses worldwide who are using this, and ultimately, we really do believe that this is gonna be a good outcome, but you know, we know it's painful in the meantime, so. Uh, if you can come and talk to us, tell us where those pain points are, that will help us find the best way to help you through this. I, I know you'd rather just hear that you will be around forever, but... Just keep it running. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we're doing, we're doing our best to do that. Uh -huh. Follow up is, so, uh, I mean, so, you know, Canvas third party, uh, it's, Canvas is committed to it now. Uh, I mean, is this sort of, I mean, realistically sort of in perpetuity, Canvas will evolve, or is this something that in 10 years, uh, or 12, I mean, you know, what's the, presume of, uh, you know, one has to adapt, whatever one yeah. has to adapt, but uh, Canvas is something that, the, I mean, we can see, foresee 20 years, or what, so it, how do you sort of see We're that? trying to think about what's, what's sustainable, what will be good now and good in 10 years, and we know that we can't count on Canvas being good in 10 years. We don't know what will happen with that company. We have a lot of reasons right. to feel optimistic, but some student out there right now could be getting their starting up, their startup going with a really <laughs> cool Canvas killer. And if that Canvas killer, that better product, came out in five or 10 years, we want to have the option of using it. So one of the things we did when we began the pilot for Canvas was we thought about, well, what's the infrastructure that we put behind Canvas that doesn't lock us into Canvas forever? But if something better came along in the future, would let us take Canvas out and put something new in and get the enrollment data in easily, integrate with our Canvas services. So we're trying to make ourselves more flexible for the future with this. Uh, you know, we certainly would hope to see Canvas just continue to be a really successful thing and get better and better and never have to do a big transition again because that would be really nice for everybody. Um, but we're trying to be ready for that possibility. Because if something better comes along, you know, we don't want to be locked in by legacy decisions, which is kind of where we found ourselves is to some degree with EE. Uh, we're trying to make sure we can do cool stuff. Yes. So um, I'm understanding that 
course evaluations go through Triple E? Yes. And, and is that, how long will that last? So Canvas does not have a course evaluations tool. We are already starting on a complete rebuild of our custom Canvas evaluations tool. It's closely regulated by the Academic Senate. Uh, we have a lot of niche needs for that system. We looked at what was out there commercially, didn't like any of it. We're rebuilding that system now. So there will be a brand new version of our campus's unique evaluation system that will integrate with Canvas coming in the next few years. Until that's ready, the current system isn't going anywhere. So we're, we're keeping things around until we have a better alternative or a, a better way to meet those needs. And that goes for evaluations. In fact, as Karen mentioned, the first component of that project is the self-diagnostic tool that instructors use for their own evaluations. Uh, that, that code base is used in the official version as well. And we've actually got that ready for a pilot this spring. So you'll be able to start seeing what that's gonna look like. People will be able to try that out while the current system is still in place and people can compare it and provide feedback and figure out how to make that a good system for the campus. So, and if I kind of summarize that in one way, it's, you're not gonna wake up one morning and go to log into something and it's just not there. Anything that is going to change in a significant way, we're gonna provide as much advanced notice as we can, not just so you have a lot of time to prepare, but so you can come tell us you know, this is what must be solved for me to be okay, you know, if, if this tool isn't available in its current form in the future. So we're gonna give a lot of lead time on all of this stuff. Uh, nothing's gonna, no, there are gonna be no surprises. Uh, that's, that's our goal. How much would it cost to keep a trip in the A lot, oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I share the faculty advisory that looked into the future direction of the Triple E. So I'm sorry for those many. The director of student and academic services, this is my team. Thank mm -hmm. you for the great job. Uh, we we have been taking this this issue very seriously, working with faculty side by side for a few years to really figure out what what to do next. And, and the information that we have gathered all published in the Triple E future direction website with extensive research and data and one driving factor is the, the huge cost that is involved in order to rebuild Tripoli and, and bring the technology up to speed to the modern technology that is required for it to function and integrate with all the new tools that are now becoming more and more po popular across various disciplines. Well, I mean, I I think I'm following on. I, we have to be sitting beside one another. We've never met. Um, <laughs> coming from different, um, you know, disciplinary backgrounds. But I came to this because I knew it was going to be compulsory, and I hate everything to do with technology. So I thought if I came in advance, it might help me, you know, go with the plan. But I didn't expect to be excited about something. And no offense, you did a great job. But I'm not excited about anything that you said. Now, having said that. Um, all of the um, tools for me are the, you know, they're a kind of boring bureaucratic aspect of my job, a very small aspect of my job. I want to give it the minimum of time. Um, I want to spend my time intellectually. I'm not teaching classes where, unlike you, I'm not trying to homogenize things. I only teach my own courses, which is very difficult too. So, you know, consistency and grade rubrics and all of that are not something it's worth my while putting a lot of thought into. Um, so I do find it frustrating um, that we have to keep adapting to something that doesn't necessarily speak to our needs. Yes, I know you say we can come and talk to you, but you know I've done that a little bit, but it hasn't, I mean, not three of you, but I think I, I know I speak for many other people who are wisely not here. Um, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, a, a, about this, and I'm, I'm very concerned because this is a humanities-based thing. Yes, we do have certain courses that require consistency and where there's a regular, you know, influx of new faculty and so on. But in terms of tenure-track faculty who are taking intellectual charge of raw material and just producing it for their own classes, um, a lot of this is you know, really the evals, the grades, um, I use message board a lot, mm -hmm. and I use the website easy version. And I am as happy as a clam to do that until I retire. Okay, so can't. I don't honestly think I need any more. Um, I could maybe do click um, quizzes, but, you know, I get paper quizzes, I get them yeah. graded in no time. And actually, 
it doesn't bother me. Um, it's easier for me to do that than to learn, a, you know, and, and be on screen more time than I like being. I prefer paper. Um, so, and I'm, I'm not, I know this all sounds very um, self-centered, but I'm saying it because I know a lot of humanities people are, you know, on the same page as me. I can see for some science type things that, you know, clickers and, you know, large classes and, you know, have you listened to what I've just said kind of thing. Um, that may work, but for my course, I honestly don't feel I need very much of that. I, I wouldn't use it if I had it available, um, and it's not what my students want. And my students, I mean, they're very used to this much better than I am, but they're not excited about it. They actually don't like it. You know, they went, they got too much of this in Canvas has been used in high school. They've got already got too much of this, you know, um, kind of homogenized system, they prefer people talking and books to read and so on. Um, because precisely because they associate this other stuff with kind of, you know, overworked high school teachers who can't grade things and so on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a sign of a less good education rather than a better one. Can, well, can I speak to it for because I trust me, I've ha I've heard this argument multiple times from many of my instructors as well that feel very similarly to you. And one of the things that I would say is that you can use Canvas for some of those small things that you mentioned, the discussion boards, those things. It allows you to do those things. What I find is a lot faster. So I, then you have more time to spend on the curriculum, to spend on the you know like to spend on the things that you like and to engage with the students and to do all of that. So. I had a lot. I had a lot of instructors who also agreed and said, "I don't, you know, like I don't really do this. This isn't my thing. I don't use technology that much in the classroom. That's not how I, I teach." But what they do is they'll use it for the very minimum of what they need and what they get out of it. But it allows them to do a lot of that, I think, faster, and so then they can spend the time on the stuff that they like. So that would be my, I guess, at least sort of plug for that to allow for your other for the other parts. And I'll just, I'll just speak really briefly. I mean, you have a lot of really valid concerns. Um, we're not trying to sugarcoat this. We're not trying to say that this is perfect and amazing and wonderful for everybody. It's the best option that we think we have. Um, and our goal is to work with you as much as we can to make this you know, not painful. Uh, it's a toolbox like any other. And some of those tools in there may be useful to you. Other tools may have no value to you, and you don't have to use them. You know, our, our, again, our, our goal is really to just provide the best options that we can. Um, and this looks to be the most effective option. Um, we brought in several different faculty involved committees to review this. You know, we did an extensive assessment project and the data that came out of that validated that this option was viable. I, I know it's difficult. Um, I know that you're tired of, of hearing to come talk to us, but I, I hope that you will still continue to share your thoughts. And, it, and really, the good, the bad, the noteworthy, if you hate stuff, we wanna know that you hate that stuff. Um, because knowing where the problems are gives us the information we need to try to fix those problems. I, I know it's tough. I know that's not the answer that you'd like. Um, but all I can really say is that you know, we're focused on doing the best we can for you with what we have. Hi. I'm, so I've been using uh, Canvas to teach uh, large lecture uh, GE science uh, courses for four quarters now. And what I really like about it, it's a very customizable. I can use whatever features I want, make it very simple for my students and myself. It's very focused on student learning and the perspective of the student is very important, at least for my classes. Um, and it seems like investing the money in helping instructors save them time to make the transition easy for them, having people transfer their grade books, do whatever it is they want done, set it up for them, that that would be a good place to kind of focus, maybe, um, to make, if you could save everybody time and get them up and running on it, um, I think everyone will love it because there's so much to love about Canvas. I mean, I'm very pro-Canvas. <laughs> I am an EE supporter also, but uh, what you might do, given the circumstances where we have to switch on triple E, one day or another, is uh, let's say yeah, address the fact that okay, you're an EEE aficionado. Okay, here is a template that you can use that would be just like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.
time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is very useful information. Um, one of the things that is a little bit challenging about the, this, if this is what you're using on Tripoli, this is what you use on Canvas, is Canvas gives you options. So I would, I would say that's absolutely an, an, a great idea and something that we can do, but it would probably be you can consider these multiple options if you're using this on Tripoli. Um, just because yeah, that will. I tried it, and I think I can just you. And there were all sorts of things that I couldn't do. There were all sorts of things that I didn't want to be done, and they were done automatically, and I had to fight to sort of cancel them now. Yeah. So we're, we're so, at 11. And there was also no transfer. I was naively thinking that if I switched to Canvas, it would sort of get all my files and you know, place them where they want to be. But then, yes, that's So we're, we're at 11.30, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I really appreciate all of you coming here today and sharing with us that, again, the bad stuff, the challenges, the problems, those are some of the most important things to tell us. Uh, again, we know it's challenging. We want to make this as good as we can for you. So I do hope that you'll, you'll work with us and, and let us find ways to help you. Uh, we'll hold more of these events. We'll absolutely be inviting more instructors in a variety of disciplines and platform formats to share their experiences, good, bad, and otherwise. Uh, and we, we'll be doing everything we can to get a lot of information out there, as well as hear from you as much as we can. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, we're pretty easy to reach. The easiest thing to remember is probably just eee at uci.edu. Anything you send to that address will go to the team. I'll see it. Karen will see it. And we'll make sure that there's somebody available to help you uh, or to hear you and, and take down any ideas or needs that you have. So thank you so much. Um, a recording of this will also be posted later for anyone who wants to catch up on this information at the time. And there are also postcards in the back. We have a really big stack of them on purpose uh, because you're more than welcome to take extras of them if there's anybody else that you want to give one of these to to help them find information or connect with us. So thank you again for coming.